Welcome back to World History One. Uh, last time we began our look at India, and now we're going to conclude our look at India with uh, the PowerPoint lecture, India Part Two. Stay tuned for the PowerPoint. Okay, class, we're going to have the PowerPoint portion of this lecture, India Part Two. Okay, we're continuing on with our look at the Aryan religion where we left off last time, and uh, it's based on what is called the Rig Veda, which means praise knowledge. And the Rig Veda is a collection of 1,028 songs, hymns, poems uh, to their gods, and it's also instructions on how to worship. Now, the Aryan religion is polytheistic, and their main god is Indra. Now, Indra was looked at as a, a god that was violent and mischievous, uh, was the god of war, and was prone to drinking and fighting. So that's their, that's their god, Indra. And the polytheistic religion was based on having to please the gods. And the way that they would please the gods would be through animal sacrifices. And the rewards from the pleasing of the gods based on these sacrifices was uh, a longer life, a larger family, uh, success. So basically, if you please the gods, these are the benefits for that. Now, they had complex animal sacrifice ceremonies and sometimes hundreds of animals, which would have been sheep, goats, and horses, would have been sacrificed to the gods to appease them. They believed all gods would come to the place of the sacrifice and then join in the eating of the animals. So the people would also partake in eating of the animals. They believed the gods would be there also to eat. Uh, the Brahmins, who were the upper class in the caste systems, would hold five or more sacrifices a day. So you can think of it's just a very involved system of religion uh, every day, sacrificing numerous times to appease the gods. Okay, so the Aryan religion is polytheistic, as I mentioned, and the main god being Indra. And this is Indra here, this picture. And Indra is covered in eyeballs. And so you can see on the arms here are little dots, and those are actually eyeballs. You can see one right here under his head. And just like all over his body are eyeballs. And that's to uh, basically say that Indra is all-seeing, is able to see everything. And then in the right hand has the sword. So yeah, there's multiple arms on Indra, and right here is the sword uh, in the right hand. And so that's their image of Indra, and being the, the god of war, has the sword in the hand. Okay, like I mentioned, that there's um, uh, the Rig Veda, and those were the, the songs and spells and all of that. Well, there's actually four Vedas, and these are groups of writings that are instructions or, or the basis of the Aryan religion. And so there's the Rig Veda, the Sama Veda, the Yajur Veda, and the Atharva Veda, and these are all uh, writings. Now, each one of these writings is divided into two groups, and in the writings there's a section for works, and then there's a section for knowledge. The first part, which is works, is made up of hymns and songs and instructions regarding rites, ceremonies, and rules of conduct in uh, in the religion to to basically instruct people how to uh, how to act in for for that Veda. And then the second half of the Veda is knowledge, and this is concerned with the knowledge of who the God that they're talking about, who that God is. So down here, these bullet points, these four bullet points right here that have the red line next to it, um, and kind of tell what is in each Veda. So the Rig Veda is religious knowledge. The Sama Veda are songs and chants used by priests in conjunction with what is called Soma. And Soma is a strong drink. So they would use this strong drink in relation with their uh, songs and chants that are found in the Sama Veda. Then there's the Yajur Veda, number three, the Yajur Veda, and that is uh, short verses that are said for sacrifices. And then there's the Atharva Veda, which is uh, which are magic spells found in, in that book. So you see the four writings, each is divided up into a works and knowledge 
uh, section within the, the writing. Religion evolved, and it focused on souls, and it focused on life, and also on death over time. So it evolved over time, and then what happens is coming out of this evolution of the Aryan religion based on the Vedas uh, comes Hinduism. Hinduism is the result of this evolution. Okay, so on the screen now are the texts uh, still used in Hinduism today, and so these are just... Uh, uh, covers, pictures of covers of the Vedas. Uh, as you see, the Rig Veda, the Sama Veda, the Yajur Veda, and the Atharva, Atharva Veda uh, there on the right. So those are the four uh, main writings that are used in Hinduism today. And really, this uh, belief system is, uh, is very easy to adhere to. One can basically um, become Hindu uh, by this easy ad adhering uh, to this, uh, this religion. Well, number one, they have to regard the Vedas as inspired. Number two, they accept the caste system. And then number three, they respect the deities and then also the sacredness of cows. And so it's, it's very easy to um, adhere to this religion. Obviously, as uh, as a Christian, uh, we would not hold to any of this as truth. Uh, we would look at this as Hinduism as um, as a false uh, world religion. So then, there's additional writings called the Upanishads, and it's basically knowledge of self and absolute truth is what this writing talks about. And so, the Hindu disciples will sit and learn lessons from the Upanishads. Uh, from what is called a sage, so like a wise man who is um, knowledgeable in the Upanishads. The Hindu will sit there and listen and learn lessons from the, the wise man. Uh, many themes deal with karma and rebirth, and what they do is they enter into a time of meditation and they, uh, they chant, and they chant the word Om over and over, kind of a mantra, and they would, uh, in, their, in their meditation, uh, they basically f come to find oneself and find absolute truth. Obviously, Christians don't adhere to this, and, um, but, but Hindus do, and this is what they, what they do. So in Hinduism, uh, the definition is basically eternal religion or eternal truth. And the teachings of Hinduism is uh, basically humans are not individuals, but are part of the universal soul, which is called the Brahman. So all humans are part of the Brahman. The Brahman is unchanging, it's stable, and it's permanent. And really what they believe is that it's the only true reality is this universal soul. So what the, what the issue is, is that people are stuck in this cycle of, of living, dying, rebirth or reincarnation, and, and then doing it over and over and over again. And the goal is to be freed of this so they can join in with the Brahman, in this universal soul. So um, basically what happens is the person is living and, and they, they die. So what happens is there's this temporary state between death and reincarnation or the rebirth. And that is called samsara. So the person is alive, they go and die, they get put into this uh, temporary state of samsara and then they're reincarnated. And then they go into their next life. Well, it, during the time of living, there's actions that are done. And this is called karma. And that is the actions one does during their life. And that has a good or a bad consequence. So if you have uh, a lot of good actions, you'll have good karma into the next life. Or if you have bad consequences, that's bad karma, which will dictate what takes place during the rebirth. So if you have bad karma, you will be reborn maybe at a lower caste or even a lower, um, a lower being. Uh, and so uh, karma is very important. And then... The whole goal of Hinduism is to be freed from this cycle of rebirth, which is called the moksha. And when one reaches moksha, they're free from these rebirths. They end up in a dreamless state of rest and peace. Basically, you become one with the Brahman, and you become uh, you have this eternal rest. Okay, so how, how does this uh, take place? What are the teachings? Well, one must live a life through three ways. They must live the way of works, the way of knowledge, and the way of devotion. 
And the way of works is perform worship rituals supervised by a priest. So that's the, the, the work section of Hinduism. And then there's the way of knowledge, and that is by studying the Vedas. So learn the knowledge in the Vedas. And then there's the way of devotion, and that is the worshiping of idols. So when one is doing this, they're able to then uh, live a good Hindu life. And then how does one achieve moksha? Well, the first way is through asceticism. And asceticism is a simple life, a sim simple living, and you deny self and you deny the pleasures. And basically some people in Hinduism, they basically only uh, beg with a begging bowl and they have a staff and they have a cloak on. So they, they try to be as aesthetic as possible and live such a simple life that they will be able to achieve moksha. And then the second way is through meditation. And meditation is done through what is called yoga, where one uh, empties themselves, empties their mind from the world. And what yoga means is union. And what it, what it is is basically one is trying to um, create a union with the Brahmin. Uh, yoga is a Hindu spiritual discipline with breath control and body postures. What mantras are to the mind with the Om and the meditation and to be able to empty the mind, it's basically yoga is for the body, the discipline of the body. And um, it's basically a focus of emptying oneself for full awareness of who one is. Now, a question comes up, should Christians uh, practice yoga? Well, really what happens is Christians try to give a definition uh, to yoga. They do these things and they say, well, they'll meditate on God and whatnot. Um, my answer to this is uh, Christians should not do any kind of yoga. This is just my personal opinion uh, because the Bible doesn't say anything anywhere in the Bible about emptying oneself. In fact, it says that we are to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so if one wants to meditate on God, which we should, we should meditate on the Bible and on God and, and have a focus on God in worship to him, uh, nowhere in the Bible does it talk about yoga, does it talk about getting into certain postures or emptying oneself. So I would, just my personal opinion, I would stay away from it with a 10-foot pole. Okay, so that is it for India, part two. I'll see you in a second. Okay, class, that is it for our look at India. We can't spend a lot of time on some of these civilizations because there's other things to get to, uh, but it gives us a foundation uh, for the, the country of India. And next time we're gonna be looking at China. I'll see you then.